my early 20s, I spent a summer in my hometown working at a family restaurant out of a commuter train station. On my very first day, my manager hands me my uniform. It's a T-shirt that reads, check out my rack. I looked around and realized that only busty women were being asked to wear it. I didn't know quite what to do, but I did know that I felt humiliated. I handed the T-shirt back and said, no, thank you. Next, I reported it. I happened to be interning at the National Organization for Women that summer, and I convinced them to add the restaurant to its boycott list. It was my first act of defiance against sexual harassment. And it taught me an enduring lesson. I have agency. I can make a difference. But as I got older, I realized that taking a stand was far more complicated than handing back a T-shirt. And that's certainly true today, in the wake of Me Too. Even as scores of men, powerful men, have been brought down, we still don't hold people accountable who aren't celebrities or titans of industry, those that abuse restaurant workers and fruit pickers and everyday middle managers who prey on their shift workers. My story is about one of those men, one of the everyday run-of-the-mill abusers who the New York Times is never going to investigate. I'm here to tell you how we can serve justice on them. During the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, I watched Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and her remarkable testimony to the Senate. She had nothing to gain and everything to lose, but she was not going to give up. She was not going to let Kavanaugh forget the horrors that she endured that one summer night when she was 15. It took extraordinary courage, and I was in awe. It didn't stop his nomination, but it did expose him for who he is. At one point in her testimony, she described Kavanaugh covering his hand over her mouth to stop her from screaming. And then he or another friend turned up the music so others in the house couldn't hear her. It triggered a memory from my own teenage years because the man who raped me didn't do that. He didn't have to. I was unconscious, either from booze or drugs in my drink. No need to clap a hand over my mouth or turn up any music. He had free reign over my body. Dr. Ford's testimony brought back a flood of memories from nearly three decades ago. And I remembered other things, too. How excited I was as a suburban high school senior to go to my very first college party to be the center of attention. There, I met Pete. He was a few years older than me, and he stayed close and plied me with drinks. Soon, he was pawing me on the couch. And that's the last thing I remember. <clears throat> I woke up hours later, bloody, disheveled, aching, and confused. I gathered myself best I could, and I walked outside only to see my bra hanging from a tree. I went straight home and told no one. Who was I going to tell? My parents? I was too scared of my father's anger and of my own shame. So I found a crawl space in my head and I shoved it up there as far as it would go. I was so deep in denial that when Pete asked me out shortly after, I accepted. I went on a date with my rapist. And I kept it buried for years. 
I told a few people I'd known, but never the full story. But even before the Kavanaugh hearings, I wondered about Pete. And what I discovered is that he looked to have a pretty picture-perfect life. Loving wife, adorable boys, and he worked as a community college professor, surrounded by young women. Dr. Ford's testimony shocked me into the realization that I needed to take action. And in many ways, this was really familiar territory for me. I have spent my career fighting for causes I believe in. I have exposed bad actors in the gun industry, and I have forced the resignation of corrupt politicians. I am not one who doesn't demand answers or who is easily pleased. So, I wrote a letter to the college where my rapist works. I spoke to the Title IX coordinator, and I told her my story and expressed my concern for the women on campus. She promised me that she would she would tell my story to the president of the college. And he, in turn, promised that he would tell it to his board of directors. They both assured me there would be a full investigation. But months went by, and I heard nothing. I later learned that the so-called investigation consisted of a single email survey to the current students on campus. And when it was completed, the president of the college said there was not a whiff of impropriety in the many years that my rapist had been at his school, and that he was no, in no position to pass judgment on behavior from so long ago. I was furious. I sat there staring at my computer screen with hot tears running down my face. But I didn't give up. I wrote to every member of that board of directors. I wrote to the State Oversight Committee on Higher Education, urging them to review the investigation and launch a separate inquiry into the actions of the president. I had a feeling, and it was only a feeling at this point, that this was more than the usual institutional desire to make an awkward situation go away. Eventually, through public records requests, I found out that the president of the college had been looping Professor Pete into all of our conversations, and that separately, he had told his board of directors that there was another side to the story, and that Pete was likely innocent. So much for not passing judgment. Also, with the help of a researcher, <laughs> I learned that in a different position, at another institution, that the president of the college had actively recruited a star basketball player who had been credibly accused of rape and had been thrown out of two separate universities. No one else would take him. And the president's public defense of those actions? Well, everybody deserves a second chance. And that's where I am today. I would love to say that the college took those allegations seriously and that it protected its students. But this is painstaking, frustrating work, and there are no quick fixes. And even if there were, and even if Pete were in prison right now, and even if no other women were assaulted, I would still be looking after that damaged, terrified, confused 17-year-old girl, me. 
and I'll likely be looking after her for the rest of my life. At the same time, taking action has value. And those actions can be big or small. Yes, you can organize protests. Yes, you can press charges. But if those things seem too daunting, you can call me or someone like me or a local legal nonprofit or a government agency or someone who has the capacity and the ability to support you and create change. The point is to do something. We all need to learn how to Me Too. As survivors, we need to reject the culture of impunity and build a network. A network with the skills and resources and experience to seek redress for all that we have endured. It is not enough for us to hope and pray that a national organization will find our cause worthy. When we understand how to Me Too, we take back our agency. And seeking justice is how we win back our voice. It's powerful and it's attainable for all of us. Thank you. <laughs>